Hey everyone, welcome to the studio. I'm Jessica Putnam Phillips and this is Live at Five here at Clayshare. Tonight we're gonna to be doing some glazing with the brand new, well new to me, Mako glazes. I know some of you guys got these a few weeks ago. I have not had a chance to try them yet so I was super excited when they showed up in the mail. And we have resumed our monthly giveaways. Now many of you know, every month Clayshare does a giveaway. We have a sponsor, they offer a product and people can win. And uh, we did that during ClayshareCon the end of February and it was huge. We gave away almost 100 prizes. It was a little crazy. And so we took a little time so that all of our sponsors could like, you know, catch their breaths. But we're back on doing promos again. So this month we're gonna be giving away four of the sample packs of the new Mako glazes. So you're gonna get a pack that'll have all five of these and they will be this size. So they'll be this size jar, so that's the sample pack size, which is still quite a bit. You can easily do a mug with one of these little jars here, no problem. So you're gonna get five of these. And we're giving away the first one tonight. So every Wednesday in May, because May is for Mako, see what I did there? <laughs> every Wednesday in May, we're gonna be giving away the sample packs of the five new Mako glazes. So hi everybody, I see y'all tuning in, hey hey. And those glazes are, in case you are not aware, I'm gonna tell them all to you right now, Himalayan salt. This is cenote. This is the, oh yeah, this is the landslide. I can't wait to try this one out. Uh, this is azurite. And the last one they came out this year is called Rainforest. So it's kind of a dark green. Uh, I think it's gonna be similar to my Oribe, a little darker than my Oribe. So I'm excited to try these out. We're gonna be doing some glazing soon. And um, we have decided to partner not just with Mako this month, but also with Clayscapes Pottery. And they're gonna be doing 20% off Mako stoneware line of glazes. So that's any of the Mako glazes that are listed as stoneware glazes, which are the new ones. This, I have a poster, it's for visual aid. I have a visual aid to show you all. Any of their classic stoneware glazes, any of their matte stoneware glazes, any of their crystal stoneware glazes, or gloss specialty clears, and even the Mako washes are 20% off. That discount is automatically applied only at Clayscapes Pottery, so you don't have to do anything except go get what you want, it's already 20% off. So you don't have to worry about remembering a code or buying something and missing out because you didn't use a code. We wanted to get a, around all that and not have everybody um, order and then realize they didn't use the code and didn't save. It's just gonna be across the board, you all go, you save. And uh, Clayscapes let me know that the combo with Mako is not also combined the discount promo with Mako is not combinable with our Explore 10 discount. We always have a 10% off for Clayshare members, but, the, but you get the better deal. You want 20% off, not 10, right? You do, I, I promise you do. And so, yeah, Frank's watching. Frank, you've tried a lot of these, haven't you? And they all look really, really good. And so uh, I see some folks asking about food safety. So be aware only one of the glazes is listed as dinnerware safe. Well, let's read the safety, I'm gonna get my glasses. Let's read the safety information on them because I wanna be sure you guys, if you're buying these, you're okay. So um, I'm looking at the Himalayan salt and it says right on the thing, not dinnerware safe. So that means what can we do with it? We can't put it on plates, but we could put it on vases we could put it on coasters because a coaster is going to be something that you're not going to have food off of, right? You're not going to eat off of a coaster. You could put it on an incense holder, right? So if you made how gorgeous would my incense holders from my class be in Himalayan salt. Uh, the wall envelope class. Make some wall envelopes. Certainly could put it on that. You could put it on little heart-shaped planters, little wall planters. You could put it on the outside of a bowl, the outside of a mug. So just because it's not dinnerware safe doesn't mean you cannot use it on dinnerware. You just wanna make sure you use it on the outside and you wanna stay a little further down from the rim, just about a quarter of an inch from the rim. That's all. 
So you could still use it, but be w aware you're not going to want to use it on a dinner plate. Now, if it was a trinket dish, like a ring dish, that's different. You can use it on that, but you don't want to use it on food wear. So Himalayan salt, outside of everything, still a great glaze. Don't put it on the inside. So what you would do is you'd use a different glaze that is safe for dinner wear, and you'll be fine. So Himalayan salt, don't put it on the inside, but good for everything else. Now, the cenote is dinnerware safe. So you could use this on the inside and the outside and not worry at all. So this one, and I have to say, I'm going to show the folks on Instagram, look at that color. And I'll show you all. Look at that. I can't wait. I'm, this is like the one I'm most excited about. That and the Himalayan salt. These two are like my, yeah, I couldn't wait to get those to try. And the, the rainforest is not dinnerware safe again. Good for textures, but put it on the outside. The landslide, not dinnerware safe, same thing, put it on the outside. These two glazes, the rainforest and the landslide, look like they're the same base glaze to me. When we look at these colors, you look at how they break, look how they're kind of similar in texture and tone. Um, I think they just added different colorants to the glaze, but we'll test them and we'll find out. And then, the last one, again, is not safe for dinnerware, and that is their azurite, which is a blue. So just keep in mind, you can still use these, just don't use them on the inside of any of your pieces, and you'll be fine. So hopefully that answers questions for food safety issue. Now, it says not safe for dinnerware, but it doesn't say it's not food safe. There is a difference. There's food safety, and then there's dinnerware appropriate or dinnerware safe. It's different. I still wouldn't put these on the inside. I would not put them on a plate. I would put them on little things other than plates. And we're also going to look at some of my favorite Mako combos. This right here, it's actually, <laughs> it's actually Amico's Cherry Blossom Celadon, but with Mako's Light Flux on the rim. And that gives that super melty yumminess going on. It's, it's just delicious. But Mako's glazes work great with Amico's glazes and with Georgie's glazes. Most manufacturers' glazes, you can mix and match them. So you don't have to worry about them being a problem as far as um, liking each other. They pretty much all work together. So Tree says not all of her Mako are food safe. And you use a lot of Mako that are food safe. Right, so when you get your glazes, when you're, before you buy them, you can always see the material data sheet and they will disclose on it if it's food safe or not. So check before you buy a glaze and it will tell you on the packaging. And then when you get it, just be sure you use it correctly and you'll be fine. It's not a problem at all. And I mean, I, I think this will be a great one to put on the outside of a vase or something with texture. Lots of texture on this one. So, okay, so Cenote is your favorite new one too. I know, it's so nice. So let me show you some other combos that are really simple from Mako that I love. This right here is a very simple bowl. It's Celadon Bloom on the outside and inside and then Light Flux on the rim. And so you have this crazy good melting going on and I, I love it. It's, it's called my beach house bowl. Like when I do anything in this combo, I call it the beach house combo because it is so nice. And that's two coats of the flux and it just melts fabulously. Love it. It's really, really nice. And then this is another, another nice one if you're into purples and blues and stuff. This right here is lavender mist, two coats blue hydrangea, three coats, and then light flux just on the top, about a quarter of an inch down, half an inch down on the top, and it melted so nice. It's, it's just, I mean, look inside that bowl. So good. So it was these three glazes layered and turned out really great. You can't wait to try the cenote in the dark flux. And I can't wait to try the cenote with the light flux, although cenote is actually Norse blue with brown crystals in it. So it is got brown. Dark flux will probably look better because dark flux usually goes a brown gray tone. And then over here I have some others. This is blue opal on this picture right here. And on top of it is night moth. 
So night moth is usually all black with these really great crystals, but when you put it on top of the blue opal, it, it goes deep, dark blue, like, like starry night. So let's let the folks on Insta and you guys can see it. It's a great combo. Like, it's really gorgeous. What else we got? We got some more. And then we're going to, because I've got like more Mako combos behind me. If you watch any of my Mako glazing videos, which I highly recommend you go do, my live broadcasts where I glaze. A lot of the pieces you see behind me, we've glazed on broadcasts. So if you want to know exactly how something was achieved, check that out. This is pink opal with galaxy on top. And so the galaxy has more bluish gray tones and than the night moth, which has more like browny, olive green, sagey tones. And then the last one I'm going to show you before we get to glazing. So Michael, you've used the cenote with the tiger eye. I don't believe I have tiger eye, but I will keep that in mind for when I order glazes next. So this is, again, I love lavender mist. So this is lavender mist, two coats on the entire bowl. Then I took Mako's Dark Flux and I put it from here to he about here with the Dark Flux, two coats. And then I did Light Flux just here on the rim, just a band of it. And look at, look at how melty that went. So I'm going to show it here and then I'm going to show it here. And it just, I mean, it's just so good, so melty. And that's just with the fluxes. Now, the flux, it's, it's a glaze. Mako calls it a flux can be a little confusing. It's a glaze that just melts really easy and makes everything else run a bit more, pulls everything down, gives, it, gives this really nice melting effect to your pieces. You love Night Moth and yeah, me too. So, hey, hey, everybody that's watching on YouTube. I see folks tuning in as well from Alabama and Montana, woohoo, and Tennessee. Fabulous. So, we're going to glaze some things with the new glazes and because they are not all food appropriate, dinnerware appropriate, I'm not going to, I usually will glaze a little plate, like a little, little thing like this. So what I thought I would do is we could do, I have trinket dishes with texture, which would let us see how the texture looks. So for the four that are not food recommended, I would do these. And then the one, the cenote that is, I was going to do a bigger plate. But then I also have some other things. I have some planters and I have this incense burner. I thought we would just have a really good time. And, uh, you know, if we don't run out of time, I'll just glaze everything I got in front of me. So we will see what happens with that. And then I see everybody chiming North Cal, Chicago. I, I'm in Vermont where it's currently raining. We have gotten six inches of rain in the last 24 hours. It's crazy. And folks from, from Kentucky. So you do three coats generally when you put glaze combos on. So for me, I usually do two to three coats, but if it's something that I'm gonna put three layers of glaze on, I'll do two coats usually because I, I try not to do more than six coats total between all the glazes. Then you run into things where the glaze peels away. And I'll show you an example right here. So here's an example of what's called crawling. And I'll show the folks on Instagram first. And actually, let's go to camera two so I can show everybody at home, I think, better on that camera. So what happens when, with crawling is when there's too much glaze built up, it actually peels away from the pot. And that's what's happened on the inside rim of this. I applied one glaze and then I decided to put another glaze and another glaze and it was just way too thick and you can see as it was firing it it just was too much it pulled away and now I have this bare spot right here now is it safe to use completely it's vitrified the clay is sealed it just looks ugly right so this is one that I've kept because the outside is spectacular but the inside is like ooh, little crawling so I would say this one had two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight layers on the inside. That can be a little too much. So that's why I try to keep it around six. So, um, and so I've done that combo. I repeated it and, you know, without the crawling, here's the same combo on a piece that, and we'll do, we'll, cam we'll do camera two. Um, this is the pink opal 
with blue hydrangea and light flux. And so you get that great melt. Same combo as that mug, the exact same. But this one, the inside, you know, I glazed it with a, a pour in glaze, so it was a little different glazing situation. But just got to keep in mind when you're layering, don't go too thick because you can have crawling. Oh, I see more folks in Georgia, Illinois, England, Canada, Ohio, where it's raining a lot too. All right. So put clear over non dinnerware appropriate glaze. Would it be safe then? Probably not. Um, so it depends what makes it not dinnerware safe. If it's because it's a matte glaze and through wear, it's going to scratch up the glaze and it's not going to look nice, then yeah. If it's because the glaze itself could leach something out because there's too, men, too much of a percentage of cobalt or something else in it that's an issue, then the clear glaze won't really help. But if it's a finish issue, like a matte, matte surfaces aren't good for food wear. You really want a satin to gloss for that. All right, so let's get started with these tests. And I have a underglaze pencil that I'm gonna use to write on my little dishes so I know what everything is gonna go to. Because when these, I mean, I think I'll be able to tell when I take these out of the kiln what they are. But if I was doing 20 glaze tests, which sometimes I do, I could not keep track of, of all these. I, I would look at it and I'd be like, oh, which one is it? So you write on the back, you get your choice. You can either write, Mako has a number, it's like SW185 for their rainforest. So you can write SW185 if you want, or you can write rainforest. It's entirely up to you. I usually write the name of the glaze on it, but you can either way, whatever you wanna do. And this is gonna be the cenote right here. Hey, Donna, first time here. Woohoo! You loved making pottery back in junior and high school. It's junior high school and senior high school. It was so fun creating colors. Yes. Well, I'm glad you're here, and I think you're going to love it. I think you're going to absolutely love it. So you don't want to ruin your shelves. Can you put too much on? You can, and the glaze can run down and stick. So I, I don't know if you noticed, and that's such a good question. Right here... Um, do you see how it's, it's only to here? I do the base glaze, the first layer of glaze, the whole thing usually. Then I try not to go further than a half to one third of the way down with the second coat. That way, if it does run and melt a lot, it's not going to run very far. If you look at this, so this one right here, I had only glazed about that much with the dark flux and about this much with the light, just a tiny bit, but look at how much it ran. So if I had gone closer down the pot, if I had glazed to here, this would have run. This would have completely run. It would have stuck to my shelves. It would have been a nightmare. And you can see right here, right here it almost went. There's a little drip. It, it was starting to go. So especially if it's your first time using that glaze, you remember last week we made all those test pieces and we talked about making test tiles and why they're so important. This is the follow-up. This is, you know, we got to glaze our test pieces now, right? So you don't glaze too far down. Now, I'm going to be doing little plates as tests. Not going to get a lot of vertical melt information on these tests because they're flat. And that little angle here is not going to give me enough information. So ideally, you want something that has a side that will give you some melt to it, right? So something like a bowl. Uh, something like a little planter, something that has height to it, that things, this, lots of surfaces to melt on this. Um, I might do the cenote with one of the fluxes on this vase here. Uh, I think that would be really nice. I can just see it with that cenote finish. Amico has a rainforest as well, so maybe write Mako. That's true, Brenda, and that's the other thing to consider if you're using a, a company's glaze that you know for a fact you might want to, that has a copy, you know, someone else, and I don't mean copy like they made the same glaze, just same name. I have glazes that are the same names. I mean, there's only so many names out there as other companies, so you can, can only do so much. So we're going to write Cenote. Yes, these squeak when you write with them. And this is a brown Amico underglaze pencil. It goes to cone five. The black ones go to cone 10. 
but I've misplaced my black one, so I'm using my brown. So if you fire hotter than cone five, you're gonna wanna get yourself the black. If you wanna use underglaze pencil, you could also paint it on with a paintbrush if you so desire, it's entirely up to you. So let's see, we're gonna do rainforest, and I'll write Mako, rainforest, excuse the squeakies. You know, sometimes what I'll do, if I don't actually want to write it on the piece, I'll give them all numbers, and I'll just have one, two, three, four, five. And then in a notebook, I'll write one, and it will be Mako Rainforest, and then I can write a bunch more information after it. So that's entirely up to you. I will write in my notebook about the test. I'll take some notes so that I know. But, you know, it's a really good idea to keep track of what you've done. So let's get these lined up. The cenotes going here to that. That's the rainforest, and then we'll go down the line. You got the Mako sample kit, and you did tests on three different clays. All were very ugly except the Himalayan salt, which was nice. Well, we're going to find out, aren't we? Because um, we're going to use these little guys. This is the landslide. That's why I am just using these little dishes, because I don't have much invested in them. You know, and I usually give these things away as free gifts. So, of course, I don't want anybody to get something not nice, but, um, you know, I would never give it away if it's not nice. I just wrote eight salt, H salt, sorry, not eight salt, H, the letter H on that because I didn't want to write Himalayan and Azurite. The other thing that's kind of good if you write just the number on the, the bottom, then if you do decide to sell your test pieces, your customers will think it's a limited edition. So it's like, ooh, I got number three. And you're like, I only did three of today. I did like 17 of that glaze the other day. Um, so you have, you know, no, I'm, I definitely don't want you to mislead anybody. Hi, Karen. So you're new, you're from Seattle, and totally overwhelmed by glazes. Yeah, glazes can be overwhelming, especially when you're starting out. I do have a lot of classes on ClayShare talking about glaze. I have a really great brushing on glaze class, which will kind of ease you into glazes, and I show different glazes, and I talk about translucent versus opacity and, you know, all those things and finishes and stuff. So you should check that out. That'll help you. And it is a very cold, rainy day. That's why I've got hot tea tonight. All right, let's do this. Now, because these are brush-on glazes, I am not going to wax the bottoms. But if they were a dip glaze, I would wax my bottom. So that when I dipped it in the bucket, the, the glaze would be repelled from the back. We're just going to brush it on, so I'm not worried about that. But you would just take your wax, and I, you probably can't tell. See how the black here is really... Um, See how bright it is here and how subdued it is here? This is because there's wax on it. This one's not waxed yet. So the wax clouds it a little bit, but it burns out at like 400 degrees, 500 degrees, so it's not a big deal. Um, it won't hurt your kiln or anything. It's, it's just, you know, to put on the bottom so glazes won't. Stick to your shelves. Hey, hey, Kathy, how you doing? So you have these and you really love the H salt. Mmm. I, I, you guys got suggestions for combos for me. I will gladly take those suggestions. So whenever we do glazing, you know, you want to prep your pieces. And I always like to go ahead and take, since I don't have running water in my studio, some folks would run their pieces, their bisque ware under their faucets. I don't have that. Um, so I'm just going to use a, a sponge and clean water that I've wrung out, and I just wipe them down to make sure no dust has accumulated. More often than not, bowls and mugs, the insides of them get pretty dusty within just a week or so of coming out of a kiln and being in the studio. So you wipe those clean, and then we can glaze. So that was pretty, pretty quick. So when your glazes come, they're going to have this little seal on them. Every company has different seals. I remove these and I don't use them again. I throw them out. Some people will put these little seals back on, but I have found that 
glaze sticks to them and dries, and then you get little chunks of dry glaze on everything, and then it just, it just makes a mess. So I don't keep those. So let's go ahead and do the cenote. I'm going to use a Mako fan brush. This little guy here is a number four. And I'm just going to swish it out. Grab my water. I'm going to swish it out in my water bucket. And then I squeeze out any excess water, you know, just like this. I'm just squeezing it out. Now, a test plate, you get to decide, do you want to put this over here. Do you want to make sure you put landslide with landslide, glaze the side right here or not? If it's just a test plate that you're only using just to see what a glaze is going to give you for an effect, you don't, you don't have to. You on camera too? I hope. So the cenote is the base of Norse blue, which is a glaze that Mako already sells. And it has crystals in it. So when you first dip your brush in, you're, you're going to not really see many crystals. But if you dig into the bottom, I don't know if you can hear it. Yeah. And once you dig around in the bottom, you're going to get all these crystals coming to the surface. And I think you'll see it more as I brush it on. And let me grab my banding wheel. Because I think when I glaze, I will use my banding wheel because it makes glazing much faster. So we're going to take the glaze and we just apply it in the center and then just start pulling it out. See how easy that is? Until you get to the very edge and then I'm just going to dab back to cover any area that I've missed. I'm going to get the very, the rim, just the side here. I'm not going to worry about going down the side though. Not for this test plate. And then you need to let it dry, and you're going to put a second coat. Whether you put a third coat or not, it's up to you. You know, this is a test piece, so it's whatever you want to do on that. So that was the, the cenote, and this one will be the rainforest. I should have pre-opened these. So indigo rain or pink opal over C-note looks pretty amazing. I have both of those. I have pink opal and indigo rain over the cenote. Is it hard on the brushes? Well, yeah, I mean over time, but I, I figure they're going to have to get replaced. So um, I'm terrible as far as like taking care of my brushes. If you want to stir it up with something else first, by all means, to protect your brushes. Let's see, what do we got? Um, I only have, the only other nice big fan brush I have is my number eight. Yeah, my big one. Well, we're going to use it because it's the one I got. Elizabeth, you can't wait until they're released in Australia. I can't wait either. So on the Mako page, they do jungle gems combos at cone five. Yes, and they melt a lot. And you know, um, this other potter, Fu Chong, he does teapots and other things using the jungle gems, and they melt, and they're gorgeous. So this one is not a crystal. This one is a translucent glaze, and we're just going to give it a little stir so we don't have to worry about <laughs> grinding down my brushes <laughs> like I did in the other, with the other one. But yeah, ideally, if you get nice brushes, these are... The Mako brushes are pretty nice, and you want them to last. So yeah, might, might want to be a little nicer to the brushes. I'll have to practice being a little nicer. So that's one good solid coat. I would even say it's almost one and a half there. All right, and then we're just going to sit this back in. Since I want to do two coats of each, I don't really want to, to wash the brush, brush out and come back to it. So I'm just going to go down the line, and I have a third brush. It's not a Mako. It's a different company's fan brush, but I'll show you um, how it works so you can see the difference in glaze application. Ah, oh, 
Oh, so we have a tip on using, when you do lusters and the little bottles sometimes tip over. So this is from Wendy. She used to take a Pringles chip lid, cut an X into it, and then slip the vial into this little slit that she made. Oh, and then you can poke a hole into the brush that you used for the gold and keep it straight with it. That is so good. That's such a great, great tip. I've been using little wads of clay, um, you know, to keep my little bottles of gold from spilling over because I have spilt gold before and it's not, not fun, but it happens to a lot of us. Coyote Fire Opal with Smoky Merlot and Light Flux is a good combo. Ooh, I've never tried the Coyote line of glazes. Um, not that I don't want to, just no place near me has them. So I haven't had the chance to try those yet, but um, definitely will remember that. I have a notebook full of glaze, glaze combos to try. I just write everything down. And then when I'm like, hmm, what should I try? And I look in the notebook and if I have the glazes, I'll just give it a go and see what happens. All right, so we're going to use a different fan brush to apply this one, and this is the landslide. That's the brown, kind of like a temaku, so it'll be an iron-rich glaze. It should work well with texture. Those of you who took Maria Sampson's Whimsical Garden Stack class, you know, you might get some good information out of these test tiles when I take them out of the kiln because everything we made in there Everything we made in that class was sculptural, so you could use every one of these glazes and not have a worry at all. So that's something to think about, right? Coyote rocks! I'm seeing a lot of coyote fans here in the broadcast tonight. Awesome. So you dip slash soak your underglazed pencils in water before you use them, and they go on easier and don't squeak. Molly, thank you. Nobody had ever told me that before. So... Now, I'm gonna try that. All right, let's do the cenote. Do you know what cenotes are, everybody? I'm gonna ask. I know this because I was a geology major before I got into, became an art major with ceramics. Cenotes are sinkholes. Some of you know. I bet a lot of you know. They're sinkholes, and we don't really have them too much here because are, we have a lot of granite, but wherever you have a lot of limestone, you get cenotes. And there's some amazing cenote caves down in Mexico. So there's a little geology for you all. All right, so I think we're just going to do those two. Those two coats were pretty heavy. So I think we're going to stop on the cenote and we're going to let that be. <laughs> Kate, big old holes in the ground, exactly. Exactly. That's right. They're big old holes in the ground. You swim in three of them when you're in Mexico, Michelle. Lucky, lucky duck. Ah, that would be nice. Okay, so continuing on. I just washed out that brush. So I'm going to continue and I'm going to use the brush I just washed out. And move it on. We're now on to the H salt. That's the Himalayan salt. You know, actually I'm thinking about the Himalayan salt. Um, I do want to see what it does on texture, but I'm going to use it on another piece as well. So what we're going to do is I'm actually going to sit this one. That's the landslide. Cenote over there, rainforest over there. I'm going to put the Himalayan salt on this piece, but then I'm also going to put it on... I don't know. I'm thinking an incense burner or maybe this planter. You folks were saying indigo rain on, no, that wasn't Himalayan salt. Was that cenote? Tell me what goes good on the H salt again. Was that, was that indigo rain with the H salt? So can you safely fire to cone six glaze at cone five? Yeah, you know, it's not actually the glaze that determines the temperature you fire to, it's the clay you're using. So if your clay is a cone five clay, then yeah, you can safely go to cone five. And I'm using B-mix five, which is a, a cone five clay. Now you can push your clay to cone six if you want. And most cone five clays can go to cone six without really any problems. But uh, except for the really dark chocolate clays, those sometimes have a few issues. When you push them too hot, they get um, 
bubbles. They get bloating in them, in the clay. Copper float looks great over H salt. Um, I don't think I have copper float. I think someone said that the, that the, was it indigo rain looks good on the Himalayan salt? Where do you get these, te my, the texture rollers? Oh, hi, Michael. Yeah, so my rolling pins um, that I designed, like this pattern here, which is my Jess's Town, you can get those from Sharon Hoppy. She makes my rolling pins. So I design them and she makes them. And she has her own line as well. And we work together on that. And it's just Sharon Hoppy, H-O-P-P-E, designs.com. And I think we can share the link for you. But I have a line of 20 rolling pins. I, I do limited editions. I don't put a lot of rolling pins out because I got a lot of other things going on. But I'm probably going to be doing a new one before too long. I have another new one coming out. But this one was my newest one, Jess's Town, and that came out around New Year. So there we go with the H salt. Now, is this one that has crystals in it? I'm not seeing crystals, at least nothing really popping up. So we're going to put the H salt over here, but I'm also going to do this little heart planter, and I'm going to, you guys are going to pick, pick it. Smoke over H salt looks good. So I want to, I want to know, have I ever swam in a cenote? I have not ever swam in one. So look up coyote two-step glaze. Okay, I will, I will. I'm trying to catch up with all the comments. So can these use, be used on low fire clay? These are cone uh, five, six glazes. So they would, you could, but they won't mature. So you're not gonna get good results. So they're not recommended for low fire, no. So I'm gonna put the H salt on the inside. That's Himalayan salt, but we've just started calling it H salt because it's quicker. I'm gonna put two fast coats on the inside. And you know, I was mentioning wax. I did wax the back of this one. So you can see it's got a pink tinge. That's the actual wax. Let's put some on the top. This is the one we're going to do. We're just not even doing waiting for a test to come out of the kiln. We're just going to glaze a combo. And this will fire like this. So sea salt has the crystals, not the Himalayan salt. That's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking, the sea salt. The sea salt's nice. I, I just discovered Mako, was it just this last year? Was it 2020 or 20, 2019? I'm, I'm new to Mako. I'm a new Mako glazer. So the Makos can go to cone 10, yes. Yes, they, all, they can, yeah, that's right. These here, um, can, it's cone five to 10. It says right on the bottle, five to 10. So if you're doing cone 10 firing, go for it. They're gonna melt more in a cone 10, just that's all. I think we're gonna do, I think we're gonna end up doing a, oh wow, indigo rain or see, see I can't pick pink or blues. All right, so this needs to sit and dry, so I'm going to scooch it off to here. We've got one more little test to glaze. Let's see how our others are doing. All right, I think that the, rain, the Mako Rainforest is ready for a second, second coat. We'll put that on. So this is two really thick coats, like two good coats on this. And that's usually my standard starting point for Mako glazes. With Amico, I usually do three. So that's doing pretty well. Get in there. Okay, so this, we're gonna sit to the side because that's done. And I'm gonna clean the brush, just wipe off. And then before you put your jars away, this is something that I didn't used to do, but I've started doing lately because I've noticed it makes a huge difference. If you just take 
the 15 seconds that you need to wipe down your jar. That way you don't get more glazed dust in the air. So that is the rainforest. And that's what I'm going to test it with starting, but we will we'll see more of rainforest. We'll do more, more pieces. I think when I get my garden stacks together and I start assembling those, I'll have this information to use for my, my baseline for my tests, from my tests, and then I'll uh, go ahead and landslide. And then I'll go ahead and use these tests to pick what glazes. I'm going to glaze those garden stacks. That's my plan, at least. Muddy waters over H salts, beautiful too. Ooh. Well, what do you guys think would be good over H salt with this heart planter? Think about that and let me know what you think. All right, this I think was too thin, so I'm going to let that one dry and we'll come back to that. And the last one we have to do of the tests is going to be the azurite. Azure, azurite, azure is blue, right? Mako does have a lot of earthenware glazes, right? So if you're looking for a Mako glaze for low fire clay, they have a lot of great glazes. They have their jungle gems. So if you like crystals, which I love crystals in my glaze and speckles and things, you're going to want to check out Mako's jungle gem line, which are low fire, but they can be brought up to cone five. They will melt really well for you. So you can try those out. So, yeah, and uh, Maeve has a really, really good thing to point out, that the Mako website has samples of every glaze at cone 6 and at cone 10, right? And so if you go to makocolors.com, that's a really great resource. So you can see. Now, like we were talking last week, remember, when we were making the test tiles, we were talking about how you want to make something out of every clay you use so that you have an example and you want to test your glaze on every clay you use. So if you use B-Mix, like I'm using here, you want a test piece for that. If you use Laguna 90, you know, you want to do a test piece with that. So you, you want to make sure you have a whole bunch of different test tiles available for you. If you only use one clay, well, then you don't have to worry about it, right? You only have to make one test tile for each glaze. Now these little dishes are really great votives for a candle, little trinket dishes, tea bag holder. Now tea bag holder and you're going to go, but tea is for food. It holds the tea bag after you've used it, so it's fine. Like you're not going to be using that tea bag holder to eat off of. I don't think. I mean, it would hold a little teeny tiny muffin and look very cute, but um, I don't know if uh, anybody's going to use it for that. Always better late than never, Liz. I'm glad you made it. All right, so let's glaze the sides. And I'm just going to do two coats on the side with the, the Himalayan salt, the H salt, and then the top you know, we'll, we'll put more on. Because we're going to put another color when you guys tell me what color to use. I'm waiting. <laughs> Don't I stir or shake them? I do not shake them. I do stir. I dip my brush in and stir them a bit. But these right here are, are fairly well shook. I think that's because FedEx coming to Vermont. I think it's a bumpy ride. <laughs> so I think that's why they're well shook up. But Ideally, if you, you notice they're a little thin or watery, you might want to stir. I mean, it is, stirring is not a bad thing. I don't shake my glazes um, because of me, not anybody else. But I have been known to not necessarily tighten the top all the way. And so if you take a glaze that's on a shelf and, and you think it's tight and you're like, oh, I want to use this, and you shake it really vigorously, right? You shake it, and the top's not on. It goes, Poosh, glaze everywhere. I have done that. Um, the other reason is my tops are now clean. There's a little bit of glaze on it from, let me wipe that one. That's from me sloshing it around. So if you wipe them clean, you don't have the dry glaze that can build up when you, when you screw it on and you don't have to worry about that glaze dust being everywhere. And it's just cleaner 
and neater. So, um, but if you like shaking, you shake. You do it. There's not really a right or wrong. It's just what works for you. All right, so we're back to the azurite, right? Not this one here. And again, these ones are not appropriate for dinnerware. <laughs> you, it would hold a, tro a chocolate truffle. Yes, it would. That would be very sweet. And the thing is, okay, so these glazes, what are we talking about when we say not, not food appropriate or dinnerware safe? We're talking about using them on dinnerware that you're going to put foods that could actually Le cause the glaze to leach into those foods. So those would be, have to f be foods that have some kind of chemical reaction with the glaze that would cause some kind of reaction. Those would be acidic foods, right? So tomato sauces or tomatoes or lemon or anything with citrus, those kind of things would really be more prone to causing a glaze to leach out. Now, a chocolate truffle or a muffin, well, that's not really going to cause anything to leach out. So you could put a piece of chocolate on a not food safe appropriate dish and serve it. I mean, you could put a little paper doily on it too and then you've completely protected yourself from any chance that anything could leach, right? But it's just something, especially when we're making pieces to sell, we wanna protect ourselves. You never want anybody to come back with any you know, issues. So protect yourself. Okay, so that we're gonna be done with the Azure, right? <laughs> and your friend did that at school and she was wearing all glaze. Yeah, um, so if you're going to shake your jars, just tighten your lids first and make sure that they are not going to come flying off. So are all the Mako stoneware ones not suitable for, din for dinnerware? No, Libby, no. Actually, most of them are suitable for dinnerware. It's just the brand new five glazes they came out in 2021. Only the cenote is considered appropriate for dinnerware. And, you know, I think it's strange they came out with that many glazes, like you come out with five glazes and four of them people can't put on the inside of bowls and plates and platters and stuff. Um, yeah, I think they would have made better choices and come out with maybe two that are not food wear appropriate and then the other three would be. But maybe they just love those colors. Like they're really on to those colors right now. You lost me, but you found me again. Well, I'm glad you found me again. Not recommended for dinnerware is about the finish. It's still food safe, right? And these right here, it's a, it's a different. So they don't go that way though. That's the thing, um, Linda. So you, we, I always uh, talk about food safe and food appropriate. So those are our two different things. We have safe, which means there's nothing in that glaze that's gonna leach out into our food and that's gonna make anybody sick. Appropriate means that the surface is a good surface, a good finish for dinnerware. So when we use something that says not food safe, that means it could leach something harmful, right? So we don't want that. When it says not food appropriate, that is the finish. So it won't hurt you, it's just not the right. So this one says not dinnerware safe. So when it's not dinnerware safe, that is telling me there potentially could be something in there that could leach out. Do they mean that or do they mean appropriate? I don't know, but they're saying not dinnerware safe. So in my book, that means you, you just put it on the outside of things, right? because you're gonna sell it to people and you might put it on the inside of a bowl and you know that that bowl is now only decorative, but if you sell it to somebody, they're not necessarily gonna know that, right? Or, or listen, because you gotta... Website. website says these are food safe, but not dinnerware safe. It basically means that cutlery... All right, so I, I think using dinnerware safe and food safe together is very confusing. I feel like safe is one thing and appropriate is another. So when they say that it's not dinnerware safe to, to me, and when I learned, when I was doing glaze chemistry in school and we talked about this and making glazes, when you say safe, that is talking about the, the risk to health. When we talk about appropriate, it's not a, a risk to health. It's just not the best use of that glaze. 
So I think Mako by doing the not dinnerware safe is, um, it's very confusing. So if they're saying they're food safe, that's interesting. So yes, you could put it on the inside of a plate. It just could be a finish that's not really nice, meaning it will show marks from cutlery. And wear over time, if you put it in the dishwasher, the, the acid in the dishwasher, in the dishwasher detergent could etch it over time. So that's an issue you have to deal with. So, I look so much taller tonight. It's because my hair is straight tonight, everyone. When I have my hair straight, I look tall. When it's curly, I look short. That's the truth. I don't know what it is. Did we pick a glaze to go on top of this Himalayan salt so I can do that? It's their legal team. Exactly. Yeah. And Terry uses a small whisk to stir. You know what would be a good thing to stir glazes with? The silicone um, spurtles. Like, you know the spurtles from that Mad Hungry? I've got some. My mom sent me some gorgeous wood ones, but I have some silicone ones. Those would be great for stirring glazes. I should order a set for the studio. Problem is I keep that stuff. All right, let me grab Indigo Rain. We were talking about Pink Opal or Indigo Rain. Um, there's my Indigo Rain over here. I got a stack of glazes off to the side. You all can't see, it's like a secret glaze stash. So I have Indigo Rain. And do I have pink opal? Um, I have the abalone baloney. You all know how much I love that one. It's actually fine with mother of pearl. I don't think I have any pink opal. I might be out. Mmm. Hate that when that happens. Yeah. Um, what is that? Red? No, red's not going to work. So we might be doing indigo rain because I don't have the other one in stock. Muddy waters. Muddy waters. All right. I got muddy waters. All right. We'll do it. First one I saw. Let me do the muddy waters. Let me grab my... I don't think I have a big one. I think I have to use a sample jar. Mm. Yeah, I don't have any big muddy waters. I need to get some apparently. I'm, I should be writing this down somewhere. Okay. Is it in this one? Antique brass, night moth, money work. Yes, so 2020, Mako's 2020 glaze sample kit, which I gave away like a ton of these last year. Um, I've got one. I've got one left. And if you remember last year's super melty glazes, they, they had a lot. And I think they all except for one was not food, dinnerware safe, whatever they're saying. And I do have muddy waters in here. Let me find it. And we'll use that since that was the first one I saw. Now, muddy waters is crazy good on lavender mist. Oh, I didn't bring that bowl. I have a big, big bowl. If you look at my Instagram feed, if you go to clay share, clay underscore share on Instagram, and you scroll back like a year ago, you'll see this big giant bowl I made and I glazed with lavender mist and with muddy waters and it is so nice, so nice. All right, so we're gonna use muddy waters. So for how long do I fire these glazes? These will go in the kiln and I will do a one and a half hour preheat and then I will do a medium speed firing till I get to cone five. And then I do a hold for about 13 minutes at top temperature. So all in all, it's about 14 hours for the kiln to fire. From the time I start it till the time I shut it down. Well, it shuts itself down because it's computerized. Himalayan salt has peach undertones. It's midnight rain over alabaster. Okay, muddy waters was a blues singer. Ah, I'm, I'm learning. I don't know a lot about the blues. I like it, but I don't know a lot about it. I just, so if you're a glaze shaker, also hold the top on <laughs> onto it, right? If you're a glaze shaker, also hold it because you never know when you're gonna send it flying. Well, it looks like we're gonna put muddy waters on this and, and Rich McNatt, um, I, hope, I hope you picked, picked good. I'll send this to you no matter what. You're getting a heart planter from me. It's going to you, so you better hope it's good. <laughs> I'm going to put it in a box, send it to you. Did I finish doing all the others? I think I did. Let's, let's finish our cleanup before I move on to that. 
I do want to use the, the cenote on an incense burner, though. I got to do something with that. I'm going to look up some combos of glazes. And maybe I'll glaze a bit tomorrow. Okay, so this one has the crystals in it. Let's try something different so I don't mistreat my poor brush. Hear it? I'm using the back end of the brush to stir it. I mean, why not? And get all those crystals up there. And then I'm just going to wipe off that with my sponge. So, I, so a little glaze gets wiped off, but I'm saving wear and tear on my poor little fan brush. My sweet little brush. All right, we're going to put this on. We're going to have something happen. I don't know what it's going to do. Actually, I know it's going to melt. But I don't know how much. So I am going to go about halfway down with one coat, let it dry, and then I'll do like a quarter of the way down. And I might, oh, I might put a little flux on here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so there you go. Is that, is, so we're, we're almost out of time. How does it, how does this go so fast? How does this happen? So, last week we made test tiles, right? This week we did glazing, and uh, we gotta give away some stuff. So we are giving away right now. I'm gonna do it right now. Let's do it. I know you all couldn't wait. So like I said, every Wednesday we're gonna do a sample pack of these new glazes. And the way you're entered is one, if you're a premium member, you're already entered. The other option is go ahead and sign up for our emails. Go to clayshare.com and you can sign up there. And follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Come find us on social media, one or the other, doesn't matter. Pick the one you like the best and follow us there so you find out when we're doing the drawings and what the giveaways are, right? Because you want to know. And so we'll have one every Wednesday, so that means there'll be four. One this Wednesday, one, one next Wednesday, the Wednesday after, and the Wednesday after that. And um, yeah, no purchase necessary. You just get a sample pack of glazes. And I will share these finished pieces. I'm going to probably glaze them some more pieces and put them in the kiln and they'll be done over the weekend and I'll share the finished pieces later. And uh, we did have some new classes come out last week and we got another one coming out tomorrow. There it is. I've got the winner right here in my hand. The winner of that. So, are you all ready? Are you ready? Woohoo! Who wants the win? Everybody wants the win. So, let's see. Uh, and asking questions, I'll get to you, Stephanie, about that glaze question. We'll get, we'll get to that. And I do have my private broadcast after this at 6.15 p.m. We're going to be making, I'm going to make you all wait. That's it. You got to wait. We're going to make this planter. Don't you want to make this planter? So we are going to make this cute square planter in prime time after. I'm going to teach you how to make one of these. So we're going to do that next. All right. So the winner of the Mako... 2021 new five glaze sample pack is Krishna Patel. Krishna, congratulations. You have won yourself the five pack. I don't have one here to show you, but it's basically this except five glazes. I have to cover up three because last year they did eight. So you're going to get little samples like this five of them to try and test out and you can tell everybody what ones are your favorite because we can't wait to hear okay so that's what i have everyone go ahead and check out clayshare.com if you have not downloaded the clayshare app yet what you waiting for go do it it's free i have a ton of free classes on there and so much more so check it out and i will see you all next week bye everyone